Ladies and gentlemen, back today, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics. We're going to be talking about animals. Specifically, we're going to be talking about do dogs, uh, our furry four-legged friends. Uh, Clive D.L. Wynn, how are you doing today? Ph.D. FLS. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very well, thanks, Chris. How are you? I'm doing good. Um, I love to talk to people like you because obviously you know your stuff and you've... so. I, First of all, let me ask you, how did you get started being interested in uh, animals in general? Well, if that's an impossible question to answer because <laughs> I cannot remember not being interested in animals, right? I mean, it just always seemed to me that there was something, something I don't want to say spooky, but something, something really deeply, curiously intermediate, right? I mean, animals, they're not machines, and yet they're not people. So even as a little kid with our cat, when I was, I don't know, four or five years old, I'm thinking, is the cat thinking something? You know, the, cat, the cat's the cat got his own life here. What is, how does that work? Why is that connected? So there's no time when I was not fascinated by animals and the things that they do. So there's no answer to how did I become interested? I don't know. Okay. Well, it's same for me. It, it just happens. It happens to you. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, but then you go on and you, you know, you, you, you study, you become a researcher, and then you're researching, you know, you're researching, what was your time like with in Australia with uh, studying the Kowoka? The Kowoka, right. So, so, so that is a story I can tell. So I go to college, and I discover that there's, that there's such a thing as animal psychology, that you can actually have a scientific study of the possibility that animals might be thinking something, or what they're doing, and how they're behaving. And so uh, that struck me when I was an undergraduate in London. And then I did a PhD in animal psychology at the university in Edinburgh in Scotland. And uh, there I was trained, you know, we're going back a long way now. We're going back to the 1980s. I was trained like people were in those days where animal psychologists concentrated on a, on a tiny handful of species that were just easy to manage in a lab space, right? So you could work with rats or you could work with pigeons. That was primarily how the game was played in those days. And early on, I got bitten by a rat. And so I shifted to pigeons and I stuck with pigeons for a long time. And pigeons, that sort of sounds kind of maybe boring, but actually there's an element of being able to stand on the shoulders of giants when you study an animal that lots and lots of other people have studied for a very long time. Because if you want to ask interesting questions about, to put it in very crude terms, what an animal is thinking, you're going to need to show that animal things and see how he responds to them. And so it's very useful to know, you know, like pigeons, we know, have excellent color vision. Well, that's a useful fact to have in your toolkit before you start asking more advanced questions. So that was all, that was all fun and dandy. And then, cutting a long story very short, I ended up in Australia, and at first in Australia, they have pigeons in Australia too, so I continued the same kind of thing. But then I realized that Australia, I only really ended up in Australia by accident because nobody in the Northern Hemisphere wanted to give me a job. <laughs> and so I went there without having done a whole heck of a lot of sort of intellectual preparation. And I knew there were kangaroos, right? But I didn't appreciate until I got there that it's not just kangaroos. There's like an Australian marsupial mammal for every niche, right? So the kangaroo is actually, in effect, a marsupial deer, right? It's a fairly large animal that runs around, eats grass, and and so on. No antlers. But, um, sorry. No antlers. No. Well, that's true. There are no antlers. <laughs> I don't. I don't mean to say they don't. You know, they're not exactly. You can tell. You can easily tell the difference. Yeah. But you know, in broad brushstrokes, in terms of where does a kangaroo fit into nature into an ecosystem it's sort of a bit like a deer and yeah so but there are also marsupial mice marsupial rats marsupial rabbits you know every every niche in an ecosystem is filled by a marsupial mammal and those animals have hardly ever been studied from the point of view of well, really, any psychological question you might want to ask. It's so uh, really just because of convenience, because the university I was at happened already to have colonies of them, 
I worked with Quokka, who are really marsupial rabbits. They're rabbit-sized. I mean, being marsupials, of course, they stand on their hind legs rather than on all fours, uh, and they have pouches. The females have pouches. But they're out there eating eating the grass. Um, and so we studied them, and we also studied the fat-tailed dunnart. And the fat-tailed dunnart is, in effect, a marsupial mouse. And they are the most gorgeous things. They're tiny little animals, uh, no bigger than a mouse. But in their little heads, they have enormous eyes and enormous ears. Uh, and so we studied those two uh, species. And we just looked at, because nobody had really done anything, we just did some fairly basic stuff. And what we were interested in is there's a whole story in Australia that marsupials are dumb that they're stupid oh, and the come basis on. for that the, yeah the basis for that is that wherever marsupial animals come into competition with you know the other kind of mammals right what we could call regular mammals technically they're called eutherian mammals wherever marsupial mammals come into competition with eutherian mammals the eutherians tend to beat them out they tend to push them to the edges really? and send them extinct yeah so, so uh, like the quokka is now exti almost extinct in mainland Australia and only survives on a few small islands because they're easily killed off by foxes and cats, which are eutherian mammals. And so anyway, so there's that kind of prejudice, you could call it, because it's not based on anything scientific. Plus, marsupial mammals have very small brains. Oh. They have they have exceptionally small brains for their body size. And so those two observations lead people, led people to say that they were dumb. And so we did very simple learning experiments where you just, you just test how quickly an animal can learn something new, like go left, don't go right, or go towards this triangle, don't go towards this square, right? We just tested speed of learning. And what was interesting was it turns out that these two marsupial species that we tested were actually really, really fast learners. And so, you know, it doesn't it doesn't amount to it, it's not like we tested. I mean, there are thousands of species of marsupials. So if you want to say that marsupials are dumb, you could say, well, it's the other thousands of species are dumb. And the two we happen to pick happen to be the smartest ones. But it seems kind of unlikely. Uh, so uh, anyway, so that's what that's what we did in australia and it, and it was a lot of fun and um and did you say did you say two two species two, and it was yeah. quokka and quokka and the fat-tailed dunnart dunnart and it, yeah, it sounds like a big kind of beaver or something what is it no it's just a little mouse type of thing oh it's a so mouse okay the, yeah. quokka is the rabbity rabbity kind of marsupial yeah and the dunnart is the mousy marsupial well, maybe they're pacifists. They're not stupid. They just don't, you know, they're herbivores. They like to hang out. And, you know, maybe just because they're easy to eat doesn't mean that they're stupid. Well, I think I think it's because, Chris, the kind of predators that the marsupials had to deal with were a different kind of predator. And we did some studies trying to help trying to help Quokka to run away from foxes. So foxes are only in Australia because Europeans brought them there, right? They're not native. And, um, and they, have, they have a way of hunting prey that native Australian animals are not prepared for. Native Australian animals, primarily, their main predators were snakes. And if, if a snake comes for you, if you're a quokka, what you should do is you should dash for the nearest cover and then freeze. That is an effective defensive strategy against a snake because snakes have extremely poor vision for objects that are not moving. So obviously you need to get out of the way, but you shouldn't run very far. You should run for the nearest cover and freeze. And that works if, you're, if a snake is after you. But if a fox is after you, that's useless. The fox will see where you've gone and will just run up and eat you. So we actually did another project where we were trying to train Quokka to run further, which we succeeded with the Quokka we trained. But, of course, we didn't have the capacity to train very many. So I'm not sure it really would save the Quokka. But still, it was interesting to see that they could learn to do that. 
I, I get this vision of you with like the Olympic trainer trying to train with the put a little headband on him so he can run really. Are you, are you training so him we, to to run outrun a snake? What? No, no, to outrun a fox. Outrun a fox. What they do is quite adequate. Oh. Right? Well, their 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 preferred strategy is perfectly adequate against a snake. It just doesn't work with a fox or a cat or a dog. Do they or, run? Uh, do they run on two legs or all four? uh on the hind legs yeah oh, really they so they're just walking what are they hopping they're hopping oh they're hopping oh it's like uh, do, all, like, do all marsupials hop no yeah 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 but yeah i really? think so yeah i thought they I all had pouches main, yeah. yeah yeah so their their whole body shape is you know hind legs really strong and boing 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 uh and the the front legs the front paws you know they they that's what part of what makes them so cute you know when they're eating something they pick it up in their front paws like like they're almost human yeah uh, and they they can sometimes lean all the way forward and balance on their front paws as well but it's not it's not a preferred way of getting around okay good to know i'm taking <laughs> notes um <laughs> look, you also wrote a book um called dog is love and that's you, right you, it's it's got lots of uh, really useful information and can you discuss the importance of socialization for puppies sure and uh, well, so, yeah yeah i mean i found this to be pretty interesting so good well so so people are surprised to learn that no animal is known born knowing no animal is born knowing what species it belongs to or what kinds of other individuals it's okay to make friends with right that's something none of us were born knowing that and no animals are born knowing that and what happens is that very early in life, animals look around themselves and sniff around themselves and listen around themselves and notice what kinds of beings they're surrounded by. And that only lasts in wild animals. That only lasts a couple of weeks. And then from then on, for the rest of life, they will seek out the kinds of beings that they were surrounded by when they were really small. They will seek out those kinds of beings for their companions, for their friends, for their family members and whatever. And um, now in wild animals, that is over very quickly. And it has to be over very quickly because, and you know, I have had hate mail for pointing this out. So I, I apologize in advance, but Bambi is not a realistic representation of the life of wild animals in the forest, right? In Bambi, almost all the animals are friends. They're almost all friends. They're almost all looking out for each other. But sadly, sadly, that's not realistic. Sadly, in real life, the animals in the forest are only friends with other members of their own species. And it's crucial that they're only friends with other members of their own species because an animal that's, that's a member of a prey species and wants to make friends with a member of a predator species, well, the predator animal is going to eat them, right? And vice versa. If you're an animal from a predator species and you want to make friends with your prey species, well, you're not going to feel comfortable killing and eating them. So you've really got to just make friends with your own species. Okay. So this is the backstory. This is the backstory. We're getting to dogs. This is the backstory. This is what wild animals are like. They are, they are born with, and they listen, hear, see, what am I surrounded by? And because that window is very short, the only animals that they're likely to come across are other members of their own species, their mother, their siblings, their father. And so they grow up, young wolves grow up, only want to be friends with other wolves, only want to start families with other wolves. Mm -hmm. Our dogs are different. Our dogs this crucial window of opportunity is much, much longer. It goes on for a couple of months. That means because it goes on for such a long time and because we raise dogs inside human homes or even if they live out on the street, they're coming across humans all the time. Our dogs during this crucial early socialization window, they can learn it's okay to have friendships with humans. If there's a cat in the house, they can learn it's okay to have friendships with cats. If they're on a farm, which was historically enormously important, a puppy growing up on a traditional farm would meet the pigs and the goats and the sheep and whatever the farm had. And that puppy, because it's meeting these other types of beings in its early months of its life, that puppy is going to grow up and be comfortable and relaxed around all these different species. 
And that's still true of the dogs that we have in our homes today, even if we don't live on farms, that they, in the early period of life, they are open to learning who, what kinds of beings, is it okay to have friendships with? And that is enormously important because you want your dog to grow up relaxed around humans of all different shapes and sizes and colors and relaxed potentially around cats or whatever other kinds of animals might be important in the community where you live. So it's an enormously important thing. And, and that's the kind of bedrock that makes it possible for our dogs to love us the way they do because of this experience that they have early in life. Do you think do you think that uh, you know these kind of great pyrenees dogs who are gen they seem to be genetically predisposed to looking out for animals rather than my dog who tends to want to kill all the animals so is this something that's learned or do the, is it reinforced after birth so so all of the above chris all of the above one thing is that we've done research where we've identified genes in dogs that have changed there's been evolution from wolf to dog all of our dogs are descended from wolves right but obviously there's been a, a lot of change in the twenty thousand years since dogs came onto the scene and we've identified three genes that contribute to dogs having such very very socially outgoing natures and we don't know at this stage but it's quite likely that the levels of those three genes varies between different breeds of dogs. We don't know that for a fact, but it seems quite plausible because certainly people always say that some breeds of dog find it easier to make new relationships than others. So part one is genetics. Part two is early life experience, where, as I was saying, there's that critical phase of early life where an animal is much more open to forming new relationships uh, than it will be later on. So part two is early life experience. What kind of experiences do you give a dog? A dog that grows up on a farm is going to have many more interactions with different species of animal than a dog that grows up in a city. So you have that. And then part three is that even after that critical early period is complete, life still goes on. Animals still have new experiences. Okay, each new experience has less impact you know, for an adult animal than it does for an infant animal, but it still has an impact. And if a dog, I don't know, let's say for the sake of argument that a five-year-old dog gets, uh, gets kicked by a horse, well, that's going to change his attitude to horses thereafter. Um, so, so all of the above and even more would be my answer. You, you can teach an old dog new tricks. It's just, Absolutely. you know, the curriculum has to be very straightforward. Well, and you have to, you have to stick with it. You know, right. I mean, one of, yeah, I mean, absolutely. We've, we've found in, we've done all sorts of different studies with dogs and we don't find age is particularly important. So long as the dog can still walk comfortably, see comfortably, hear comfortably, um, which of course is, is always a factor as, as an animal gets older. But if, if, if the senses are still functioning and the body can still move, then they learn perfectly well. Good to know. I wonder if it's the same for humans. It must be, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, you've also talked about positive reinforcement training for dogs. You, uh, you think it's very important. While I see people in my neighborhood that still have these, you know, choke chain collars and zap, you know, zap them for barking. Kind of. So what, what's, what are some of the implications of uh, positive reinforcement? So positive reinforcement should, should, I think, always be everybody's first go-to option. It just means you you provide a treat when an animal does the right thing. And I think especially when you're trying to uh, modify an animal's behavior by adding something to the animal's repertoire, if you're trying to teach the, the I'm looking behind your head, if you're trying to teach a dog to play the violin or the banjo, then I think uh, undoubtedly positive reinforcement is the only way to go. You're never going to get anywhere with punishment. I must say I have, I have slightly revised my, uh, my, I've always been extremely critical of people who would use painful punishing methods to train a dog to do anything but i have been somewhat modifying my position insofar as i think there are some things that some dogs desire to do like chasing cars okay now it's not it's not that common but still and all if you have a dog that wants to chase a car some of these dogs the drive to do this is so unbelievably strong and it's very difficult to counteract that 
purely with treats because yeah the dog just finds the chasing activity just so much more rewarding than any treat you could come up with and so i'm i'm willing in the hands of an expert i'm willing to at least allow for the possibility that a situation like that uh where you might be able to teach a dog i think you could um, we ought to do research on this but i think you could potentially teach a dog that uh cars bite right? right you could use a remote control uh, and that that might be a situation where it might be defensible but for most people most of the time uh positive methods are, are surely far more humane and are, are yeah. very yeah. effective i mean they it would be hard to get them to connect but i did see a video of a pit bull there was a pit bull that was wanting a cookie and then there was a puppet of a godzilla and somebody had it and uh uh or it was a ball that there was the the treat and the the godzilla puppet went for the ball and the person slapped the godzilla puppet over and over and over and over and then they went to go give the pit bull the ball and the, the pit bull said that's interesting i'm good i don't want that maybe afterwards you could send me the link because that's quite intriguing okay i will if i when i find that later because that went viral and it was it was everywhere i, I think zoologists are saying how it's so much more f easier to study animals now because everybody's out there taking videos of all kinds of stuff like crows you using a piece of plastic lid to s be as a surfboard down a down a snowy roof you know there's all kinds of great ah. great ah. animal footage out there ah. now ah. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, this is important stuff. I mean, I'm tr I'm still trying to figure out why my dog scoots rocks around every day. She needs to. She's a German Shepherd, and I found out that German Shepherds instinctively need to take rocks and scoot them around as some kind of weird game. You have any That's insight weird. on I, that? <laughs> I had not heard of that. I had not heard of that. So, when you, what do you mean exactly by scoot around? Well, she'll come up to a rock, you know, yeah. pounce, pounce on it one time real good, and then. Mm -hmm take it and fling it but you know behind her through her back legs and then flip around really quickly and then try to get it again and do the same thing and it's just, i guess she's trying to see how far she can you know hike it like a football in between her legs yeah. or uh i don't know but i've seen other german shepherds do it and i just i'm not sure where that fits in with the whole evolution thing but well it sounds like it sounds like so all of our dogs are descended from wolves wolves are hunters of live prey right if if uh, wolves make their living a family of wolves which we call a pack gets together and chases after a nice big juicy deer or whatever right and they they do that that's what they do and that's a highly skilled activity i mean you and i couldn't do that chris i mean that's a really tough job our dogs are all descended from wolves but most dogs have lost most or many parts of the complex sequence of behaviors that go into hunting things. And yet, almost all dogs have at least a little bit of that left in them. So you see little bits and pieces of uh, hunting behavior, even if it's just staring, right? Dogs sometimes will just stare fixedly they'll pick something moving in the backyard a bird or whatever it might be and they'll just stare i mean that's that's phase one of hunting phase one of hunting is finding something that might be worth hunting and keeping an eye on it but you know my own dogs you'll stare for hours but you'll never actually chase anything or hunt anything but there it is so it sounds like your dog has some other part of the hunting pattern of behavior that's really strong in her and for her it involves uh, you know sort of a, if i'm understanding correctly maybe attacking it and then sort of making it move and attacking yeah. it again you know yeah, you yeah. get a lot of what we see when we see dogs playing with regular toys that we buy for them a lot of what they're doing is sort of a bit of a pounce and a kill bite you yeah. know killing it and then oh it's not actually dead let's make it move and kill it again you know yeah and my dog specifically needs something more real than a toy because inside the house no toy is interesting whatsoever yeah but outside the toy becomes more interesting and then even better is something wild you know out there yeah and yeah uh, and uh and I, I love that you we were just watching your video about pointing and it was like we don't know you did you did there's this big controversy maybe you can explain it about whether or not dogs or wolves can or any animal for that matter um 
communicate with humans in a way where they can understand a point. Can you keep right, talk right, about right. this a little bit? Sure, absolutely, absolutely. So this was sort of where I first became interested in studying dogs. Uh, that at the end of the 20th century, in the late 1990s, a couple of papers appeared where scientists were doing this really simple thing. They were just stretching their arm and pointing at the ground, and they were seeing if a dog would go where you point. And sure enough, the answer is yes. I mean, people can try this with their own dogs. About eight out of 10 people will find that their dog will go where you point. Um, and okay, so they do that. But what does it mean in a bigger picture? The claim that was being made by these scientists in the late 1990s was that this was something that only dogs could do, that it was a consequence of domestication, that over the journey that dogs have been on, from wolves to dogs, the journey that they've been on, they have picked up mental skills in understanding what humans are up to. And part of this shows itself in dogs' ability to follow a human pointing gesture. And these people were claiming that wolves, the animals from which all of our dogs are descended, that wolves could not understand this. Now, that's sort of where I came in when I started studying dogs because I got an email out of the blue from a place called Wolf Park in Indiana where they've been hand-rearing wolves since 1974. So they've got the most beautifully hand-reared wolves you would ever come across. And the folks out there... They had heard about these scientific findings and they couldn't believe them because they work all day. They spend their working hours with the wolves at the park and all of them have dogs that they go home to in the evening. And so here you have people, not scientists as such, but people with as nuanced an understanding of the similarities and differences between wolves and dogs as people you could possibly hope to meet. And they were sure that the wolves would follow pointing gestures. So they reached out of the blue. They reached out to me and they said, would you like to come up to Wolf Park and test our wolves on this? And this is quite a long time ago now, but it was one of the most, it, was, it happened to be my birthday. Um, <laughs> and it was one of the, the, the weekend that we went up there was my birthday. And so it was one of the most exciting things that's ever happened to me in science where we actually did the study. And we had people point at the ground in front of the wolves and you know what? The wolves were every bit as good at following human pointing gestures as any dogs we ever tested. And so this convinced me that this ability to follow human pointing gestures is, is not something special that evolved in dogs. And in fact, in the intervening, whatever it is now, over a decade, people have tested all sorts of different species of animals. And you can find we tested bats just because we happen to have access to bats. We tested bats and we were able to test bats that had two different backgrounds. Some of the bats, this was at a sanctuary in Florida. Some of the bats at the sanctuary were, have been born at the sanctuary and have been raised by their batty mothers. Other bats at the sanctuary ended up there. Oh, that's my dog now responding to the Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the bats at this sanctuary had originally been people's pets. And bats do not make good pets, and people almost inevitably end up abandoning the bats as they grow older. And so the sanctuary had two groups of bats, bats raised by bat mothers, bats raised by human beings. And we did the pointing thing with the bats, just like people had done it with dogs, just like we'd done it with wolves, everything the same except reversed in the vertical dimension because the bats would move by by pulling themselves across the ceiling of their, of their, it's like an aviary, right? Right. And so they're pulling themselves. So instead of pointing down, we pointed up, but otherwise everything else was the same. And what we found was bats raised by human beings will follow human pointing gestures. Whoa. But bats raised by other bats, as bats should be, yeah. Do not follow human beings. Oh, interesting. Gestures. Okay. So what that tells us is it doesn't matter what species you are. What matters is what kind of experience of life do you have? Mm -hmm. If you live alongside human beings and you depend on human beings for all the things that matter in your life and you have eyes that can see, then you will pay attention to how people move their limbs around because People moving their limbs often predicts where things that are important to you are going to end up. Yeah. And that's the case with our dogs. Of course it is because they 
They live entirely close with us, dependent on us. You can make the life of a wolf that way. Obviously, most wolves don't live that way, but a wolf that's hand-reared by human beings, its life is that way. Certain bats, but not, of course, most bats. So it's nothing to do with domestication, what species you are. It's all about what kind of life do you lead. So at what point do you think that they make the connection between your hand and the the good thing that they want? Obviously, there's some motion to a hand movement that goes, you know, and that catches the eye of most, you know, animals. But then, you know, you think it's just trial and error over and over and over. Eventually, they 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 put together a point with an, a direction or how, how, what do you think? I think, I think they pick it up pretty darn quickly, Chris. And I base that on a study we did at an animal shelter okay. again in Florida. And at the animal shelter, uh, you don't really know where the, these dogs have come from. Some of them are found by the side of the road. You don't know their whole background history, but what we found was that the dogs at the animal shelter, most of them did not follow human pointing gestures. Mm. They didn't know what to do. And these were the friendly dogs at the animal shelter. I mean, some of the poor mutts at the shelter are terrified of people. We didn't try and work. I like to say we only work with volunteers. If we went to visit a dog in his kennel at the animal shelter and he didn't want to come out and play, we didn't try and drag him out. So we're only dealing with volunteers. And they, and they like the treats. We make sure that they like the treats that we have, but they didn't understand human pointing gestures. And so I said to my, to my graduate student, I said, I want you to go back. I want to know what would it take to teach a dog to follow a human pointing gesture? And I said, I want you to go back to the animal shelter and I want you to work with each of these dogs all day if you have to. And she said, well, I'll give them 30 minutes. This was Monique Udell, who's now a professor at Oregon State, who's brilliant. Uh, she said, I'll give, them, I'll give each one 30 minutes and we'll <laughs> see what happens. And you know what, Chris? It only took 10 minutes to teach these dogs to follow a human pointing gesture. So they can pick it up extremely quickly. Uh, my guess is if you bring a dog home, if you bring a dog home from an animal shelter, the dog will have all sorts of issues, of course. But within a couple of weeks, you'll find that, you know, he's responding to your gestures and, of course, he's, he'll be affectionate and all the rest of it. Um, I mentioned that because some people think that dogs at animal shelters are like used goods, ca discarded, rejects, you know, and it's really not true. It is true that they will at first be confused and obviously lost and upset when they come home with you. But give them a couple of weeks. I mean, heck, you know, for anybody who had to come and live with you without knowing what the heck's going on, obviously there's going to be a period of, of adjustment. But a couple of weeks and they'll be perfectly happy. Oh, I think that rescue dogs, after they get over the initial hump of trauma that they've experienced and they realize that their life is pretty much set, mm -hmm. they become better than the kind of spoiled from <laughs> birth puppy dogs that I have, right, laying next to me. Oh, well, I totally agree with you, Chris. I think it's true of humans as well. I'd always rather right, have Right, right. <laughs> the inherited <laughs> wealth kind of crowd, right. yeah. These these uh, these pedigree humans, they're really, right. you know. There are some rich people that believe that they're descended from the pharaohs. I say it does not matter because a mixed breed is the best thing that you... Just look at the beautiful Mexican street dogs. They are yeah. healthier than uh, all the rest. So. Totally. So, you know, you've written a lot about dogs. I mean, what's the, what's the consensus about dog abandonment and relinquishment? Can you, what are some strategies that we can use to promote responsible dog ownership? Sure. Well, we were saying, you know, point one, adopt, don't shop. Uh, we really, we really want to put the puppy mills out of business, uh, whatever we can do to educate people. If you are going to purchase a dog rather than adopt a dog from a shelter, then for goodness sake, make sure you meet the parents, make sure you know where the dog is coming from. You know, I mean, again, when I lived in Florida, there seemed to be more of a phenomenon, but people were selling puppies off the back of trucks outside Walmart, you know, and, um, and I know, I know, you know, life is, 
I'm not going to pretend I don't realize that life is rich and complicated. I know that some of the most beautiful dog human relationships have come from that circumstance, but still and all, I really, I really would prefer people to adopt rather than shop. And if you're going to purchase a pup of a particular breed, because you care about breed, um, then be, you know, do some due diligence on where this animal is coming from and don't encourage puppy mills. Um, one thing I would say to people is breed makes less difference than we traditionally tell ourselves it does. It's true if you have sheep and they need herding, there's a limited number of breeds of dog that will do that job for you. It's true that if you shoot ducks and you want a, a you know, the, what are they called? The dogs that help people with the duck shooting business. Yeah, yeah, you need a particular breed of dog. That's all true. But if you, but mo for most of us, none of that is relevant or important. Very few of us have sheep. Very few of us go duck hunting. Most of us just want a companion in our homes. And there have now been a couple of studies that have looked at thousands or tens of thousands of dogs and done personality tests on these tens of thousands of dogs. And what they find is that once you leave on one side, those behaviors that are specific to certain breeds that really don't matter to most of us, then on the general personality dimensions, you know, what we could call extroversion, introversion, um, you know, all of those kinds of things, breed doesn't help. Knowing a dog's breed doesn't help you most of what we say about breeds are just you know what we used to call old wives tales there's just no scientific basis for them if when you're adopting a dog just like when you're starting new human relationships interview individual candidates and place on one side your prejudices that are that are that are built from whatever you know demographic characteristics a certain shape or size or color of person might have give yourself a chance to get to know the individual that's how you would do it in human friendships that's how you should do it when you're making a new friendship with a dog as well you might you're saying that there's a possibility there might be a husky out there that doesn't scream his head off yeah absolutely <laughs> now but mentioning huskies brings up another point we're not exactly breed but size and shape are important Okay. So here today in Tempe, Arizona, we are expecting 46 Celsius, which is, I think, 117 Fahrenheit. And even at six o'clock in the morning, it is still over 32, over 90 Fahrenheit. And when I see a Husky or a German Shepherd, oh, I, could, I almost weep to see yeah. these poor, poor dogs. And the truth is, in the summer, you hardly ever see them. People simply do not take them outside. The dogs will not go outside. So when you're choosing a dog, this isn't really about breed, although breed obviously comes into sizes. You know, breeds have different characteristic sizes. But think about your life. What is your life like? If you are a runner, then get a dog who likes to run. But, you know, I'm a couch potato. I got a dog who loves to just curl up next to me on the sofa when I'm watching TV. She's the right dog for me. She's also under 40 pounds, under 20 kilos, which is, you know, even smaller would be better in such an extreme climate. But I, I think, you know, this extreme heat, small is good. Yeah. Now, of course, other parts of the world, like Alaska, Alaskan Huskies, Alaskan Malamutes, German Shepherds, you want the big furry dogs protect them from the cold with their big heavy bodies and fur uh so think about what kind of life you have i mean people so often get dogs aspirationally if i get this dog i will become i don't know a sled dog racer or something but be realistic about it think about the where are the you know students often come to me here at the university asking me for advice on what kind of dog they should get and I asked them, well, what kind of life do you lead? And where would a dog fit into that life? Which often in the case of a student ends up with us agreeing that they should wait a few years until their <laughs> life is more stable. Because, you know, these students, they work hard, they play hard. There's not a lot of space left for a dog in that kind of life. So 
They definitely yeah. want to be around him and touch him and pet him and stuff because yeah. every human deserves that. Yeah. But, well, and, and I'm I'm fully on board. And people can borrow dogs. Right. You could go. You could volunteer at the local animal shelter, kids. If Absolutely. you're in college and you want a dog, go down and and you rent a dog for an hour, take him for a walk. He'll be very much appreciated. No, no, no. That's a very, very good point. Thank you for adding that in. Got to do it, right? You got to got to tell them. Uh, it is. It's kind of horrific what happens to dogs on the on the day to day. They're not. They're they're second class citizens, and it's going to take a whole lot before we realize that you know they're just as cool as us, just a little bit different. They smell better than us, even though they can't process everything just just so. Um, but yeah. So the last question I had before we go is about. How long, because I've seen you talking about the ancient Egyptians and stuff like this, how long back have we had this relationship with dogs? Let's talk, let's talk domestication. Sure, absolutely, Chris. So this is, this is going to be my new book, if I ever finish it, okay. um, which is a whole history of the dog-human relationship. And the origins, it's been a bit of a moving target because there's been a lot of new kinds of science genomics and uh, and archaeogenetics, where they actually now are able to get genes out of archaeological specimens and figure out patterns of relatedness. So I think the best the best uh, estimates right now are about 20,000 years ago. Now, that turns out to be a very interesting moment in history because it used to be thought that dogs only came into being after the Ice Age ended, which is, I don't know, 14, 15,000 years ago. 20,000 years ago is not just back in the last Ice Age, it's actually the worst moment of the last Ice Age. Just before the Ice Age ended, it actually got worse before it got better. And so there was the, it's called the last glacial maximum when almost the whole planet was uninhabitable and the few surviving animals, including humans, were forced into these little pockets. And it seems that, so in these pockets, all different species are crammed in together. It's like a crowded, like a little island of habitability surrounded by oceans of ice. And it seems that when that happened, people and wolves got kind of squeezed together and that is the kind of gelling moment that led to uh, the origin of dogs. So that seems to have been the very first beginnings of anything. Wow. Yeah. And and then I've seen pictures of, you know, in the uh, kings and queens would let dogs and cats sort of roam wild in their courtyards. And it's just been like like this ever since. Just. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So. So, yeah, and what I find so fascinating is I'm writing about all the different epochs of human history from 20,000 years ago, and then the end of the Ice Age and the beginning of agriculture, and then, you know, the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Greeks and the Romans and then the medieval time. And what's so interesting to me is at each stage along the way, dogs and humans have had a very, very intimate relationship. But what I find so fascinating is that the things that dogs and people do together keep changing. And as the world changes, you would think, well, if dogs have been primarily helping people hunt and now people have agriculture and so they're not hunting so much, you might think, well, they don't need dogs anymore. Dogs have become useless. But no, dogs now become indispensable, but in a new way. So now dogs are protecting our livestock and helping us move livestock from winter pastures to summer pastures and all this kind of stuff and so they become indispensable again but in a whole new way and then you know obviously that comes to an end and we have like the industrial epoch and well, the industrial epoch who needs dogs now well it turns out dogs become <laughs> indispensable yet again and so they, they any, can't they can't work in factories but they can sure keep you company when you you know when you come well, that's right that's exactly right that's exactly right that's where i mean people have had pet dogs Wealthy people, kings and queens and whatever, noble people have had pet dogs going back, ancient Egyptians, whatever. But it isn't until the industrialization that like ordinary people get to have pet dogs. And really? So uh, it's a very 19th century phenomenon is sort of dogs for everybody as pets. 
Um, I, which doesn't mean that ordinary people hadn't had emotional connections to dogs in earlier epochs, but right. the dogs that just hung around the house and did no real work, but just provided people with company. That's a, that's as a widespread phenomenon. That's really quite modern. I just found out today that Karl Marx had a dog, uh, and I thought, I thought that this was a working class thing. Very bourgeoisie of Karl Marx to have a dog in, well, in the eighteen hundreds. Well, because Karl Marx himself was very bourgeois. <laughs> he was he was very intertwined with the bourgeoisie. His sister and yeah. his uh, uh, partner in crime, Engels. Yeah, yeah. I did not know about Karl Marx's dog. Thank you. Yeah, I know about about his uh, contemporary. And almost neighbor in London, in um, well, not they're not contemporary at the same time. Sigmund Freud had a dog, and Freud usually had the dog in the therapy room with him because he thought the dog was a was a close observer of human nature. He thought the dog was a very a very useful companion to have in the therapy room. Yeah, well, go figure. It is. It really is. <laughs> I, I would put I put all my money on that bet. Um, yeah. But and then I, I'm really glad that I didn't ask you about Pavlov because I know enough about that where I would just be totally sickened by Pavlov. But we did learn a lot from Pavlov. But I know you know a lot about it. Well, so Pavlov, we have to see. I mean, we don't have time for a whole thing on Pavlov. But, <laughs> Next time, uh, Pavlov. Pavlov actually was very affectionate towards his dogs. Okay, the science that he was doing would have been painful for the dogs, but. He um, part of the secret of Pavlov's success was that he was so careful with the surgery that the dogs would live on afterwards, whereas his competitors at that period of human scientific history, their dogs would seldom recover from the surgery. Yeah, okay. And part of Pavlov's success was that he believed in the importance of sterile operating procedures when that was not a widespread belief. Yeah. And he cared for the dogs. He gave all the dogs names, and at, at the very end of his life, the, the International Society of Physiology people, physiologists, wanted to erect a statue to Pavlov, and Pavlov refused the honor and told them instead they should erect a statue in memory of all the dogs that had died in his science. All right. So he, had a, he was a complicated character. And it would be wrong to see him as simply, you know, cruel to dogs. Sick Absolutely and not. twisted. Okay. Well, you just put a little bit extra points in his column on for me <laughs> because last I checked, I said I wasn't too impressed. Uh, but um, <laughs> science—it's it's just a tricky thing, you know. You, the animal testing and the and the and the advancements in science that make everything better. It's like this big gamble on the future. It's just painful. Oh yeah. Painful to watch, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. And, and I think talking about historical figures, it's very hard to know. It's not fair to judge historical figures by modern standards. And yet at the same time, at the same time, clearly some people in the past were mean and horrible and cruel. Um, so in some you, sense... You know, Genghis Khan was actually, in, in, in a weird way, a great environmentalist. He, he killed so many people, they said, that the, the, the forests of Eurasia had time to like reproduce before they were you know cut down in you so he was the first like really green guy well there's a thought right there's a thought. <laughs> that's my twisted brain yeah <laughs> it's interesting uh, yeah yeah just a joke little light humor before we go um look i want to you come back and do this again right yeah sure all right so when your book gets done we'll have you back on we'll do it again next uh, time i'm in germany i'll pop in pop in hey i'll cook you the best vegan food you've ever had in your life i can do pizza i can do you know uh tofu scramble i can do all kinds of fun stuff great great Deep fried mushrooms whatever you like but we also have, you know germany's got the best versed versed in oh, the world I know. yeah i know i know yeah yeah come, yeah. come hang out with me i would appreciate I it i will uh, Clive D. L. Wynn, a uh, wonderful human being. He is a expert on dogs. He's got a book out called Dog is Love, Why and How Your Dog Loves You. Uh, great read. Also uh, directs the Canine Science Collaboratory at Arizona State University in Tempe. How's that? Good. Pretty good. Good. Huh? Wonderful. Well, let's sign off to all these yokels out in TV land, and then we'll chat a little bit afterwards, okay? Excellent. All right. Bye. Thanks.
Thanks for coming. Bye, guys.